Now let's take a look at the asteroids. So, Razzy, beautiful astrology reading, quite perfect. This is all about sort of cleansing our psyches enough so that we can decipher the spiritual breakthrough messages we're getting without getting super confused or like ripped into the emotional current, right? And I think that there's a lot of asteroid astrology that's helping us, especially in terms of the goddesses, to actually um, really allow this to be the karmic ending that it wants to be so that we can have a new beginning. The equinox, and then even further on April 12th, there's a big conjunction between um, Jupiter and Neptune. So we're kind of like cleansing, cleansing, cleansing for this like big, you know, spiritual cleanse, like a big wash. It's like if you clean the car out a couple times, you know, a week, instead of just waiting until it's completely trashed, you don't have to get the like mega wash, okay? Notice where this is happening in your chart, because two weeks ago when we started this cycle with the new moon in Pisces, we were beginning a new cycle in the area of our charts that really is connected to the divine and to our creativity and to this like higher love compassion, right? And now this full moon is illuminating where maybe, maybe just maybe, there are areas in our lives that we actually need to clean up specifically in that mental area so that we can fulfill the desires from the beginning of our cycle two weeks ago. So for me, for example, two weeks ago, this cycle was starting in my 10th house of my career. Well, now this full moon is in Virgo in my fourth house. So I'm like, okay, if I really want the seeds of my desires to, to be brought to fruition, what do I need to do at home and with my routines and habits, my daily life rituals, and where I live and how I live with what, with who, all of those things are really now being questioned um, because I, I know what I want uh, or wh I know where I want to go in terms of my career. So how do I actually set my home life up to be in service of these higher goals? So whatever house it is in your chart, I can tell you where it is falling in the houses so you can think about it more specifically for you. But really you want to think about, okay, two weeks ago we started this cycle where it was like, if anything were possible, and now we're seeing, well, but here's where I'm getting in my own way or I have a mental block around this or there's a lot of fear of not being perfect that it, that is coming up that actually is getting in the way. So this is where we want to be with that energy. I also think it's worth noting that, you know, last night when we had the Zoom renewal, so the 16th and, and even into the 17th, there is a little bit of confused energy. You know, um, on Wednesday, the moon was exactly opposite Mercury in Pisces. So even though we might have been having like big dreams and visions, we also could have been like reading things the wrong way or reading things in an emotional way or getting more confused than we need to be. So part of what this energy leading up into the official full moon, which is happening um, technically Friday, but it's like three in the morning Eastern time, but all day today uh, and leading up until this full moon and then really feeling it on Friday, we're noticing what comes up for us to create new routines and rituals around once this moon becomes full. But if it's a little bit confusing right now, that's okay. Be with the confusion. And huge recommendation would be, you know, I know we all say we meditate, aka we like sleep in an extra 10 minutes in the morning. That doesn't count. Or maybe it does. But I would really invite everybody to... Um, amplify their meditation practice specifically for this next two weeks because you know it's not about like sh quieting the mind completely but it is about really just witnessing noticing when you quiet the mind when you find yourself with a still mind what is there what comes up if you if you have a still mind and then you're feeling anxious or restless or anxiety there's no judgment but it's really important to notice because that's actually the emotional thing that's getting in the way of you really having that clarity that you're desiring about the next steps to take uh, to actually bring your spiritual vision in wherever Pisces is in your chart to Earth in real life, that's Virgo, right? But let's look at the asteroids and then we'll get into journaling. So first thing I want to call into attention is a very powerful asteroid, asteroid Kali, Kalima. If, uh, if you're not familiar with Kali, Google it, okay? But really, uh, Kali is... She's the ego destroyer. I mean, it's a very divine, feminine power goddess. 
but she is associated with death and destruction. She is associated with the underworld. And so some people see Kali and they freak out. Other people see Kali and they're like, yes, let's torch this bitch. But the bottom line is the, the, the essence of Kali really is about like standing in your power and clearing the way for um, what's right. To, to have the space to be able to be rebuilt. Kali is a destructive energy, but also a very purifying energy. And she's a dark Hindu goddess, which is, it, it makes this sextile between the sun and Pluto almost to the exact degree. So it's interesting because we have Kali with the sun. So the fire underworld goddess is with, is with the sun in Pisces. Even though Pisces can be really underwater, we know that fire and water don't always blend, but in this case, she's sort of being like, how long? She's like that volcano that's erupting in the middle of the ocean, or the oil spill that lights on fire. Like, there's this sort of sense of chaos with Kali, but it's not for nothing. It's, it's very on-purpose chaos, and it is like righteous chaos. So it's like, yeah, fuck this. We're burning it to the ground, because on the other side of it, there is a, a new beginning, right? Also very apt right before spring actually begins and right before the new astrological new year begins. It's like, yeah, actually this is Pisces, Kali. It's like literally end this, literally end this cycle. This shit sucks uh, when, when there's all this gunk in the space. So get it the fuck out, whether that's in the area of cleaning your space or cleaning your mind, maybe a little bit of both, working with your body, getting back into your body. Kali is trying to wake up from that Piscean subconscious place, like, ah, so if you're feeling restless or if you're feeling agitated or if you're having miscommunications with people, there's, that's okay. That's really important because it's showing you where there's some energy that you might need to really work with from the depths and it's in a harmonious relationship with Pluto. So, you know, we got two underworld god, goddess counterparts sort of hanging out, being like, yeah, fuck this shit, out with the old, in with the new. And how can we ground these new spiritual visions in actual reality uh, and what really needs to go? And I also want to note, you know I love, love asteroids. We have asteroid Valentine, the asteroid of true love, the asteroid sitting right there with Pluto. So this is not for nothing. We're not torching the old because we're just bored or sick of it, even though that could be why consciously. We're, we're torching the old because there is actually... Uh, there's true love available. There's our the, the our heart's desires that have been buried down there with Pluto are actually being reawakened in this energy. So it's not even like it, it's 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 less even like in with the new and more like in with the shit that's been buried deep. And I think it does have a lot to do with. I mean, it's not a coincidence that we have Mars and Venus traveling together, right? So like we've had Mars and Venus traveling together. They finally just moved out of Capricorn, which was very intense and it's a very erotic. Like Capricorn is very much in the body. These are very sexual energies. If um you know, if like the past month you've been hot and feeling horny, it's, it's that Mars and Venus and Capricorn love to fuck. With Pluto, it's like, let's have sex from the depths, you know? So, um, so with Pluto, it's, yeah, it's been very erotic. But now Mars and Venus have moved into Aquarius. So it's a little bit lighter. It's a little bit more mental. We can sort of detach a bit more, which makes it easier to see where we're either continuing old patterns that just aren't serving us or, or even just thinking patterns that are making our actual in real life relationships worse or that are blocking us from love. And I also think, and we're going to talk about it because Mars and Venus, not like we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it right fucking now. Okay. LOL. Next. Why I think this is really hopeful for relationships, even if it causes some discomfort over the next two weeks, you know, we have Mars and Venus, Venus a little, Venus a little bit like leading the way, but they're together. And then we have asteroid Juno right there with them, the asteroid of marriage. And then we have Saturn, right? So between this sort of Mars Saturn sandwich, we have Venus, the goddess and the wife. And so there's sort of a, I think I think we're thinking a lot about what society has taught us love is. What society has taught us the role of the masculine is, the role of the feminine is. This is what love looks like. This is how we act when we're in love and and everybody is expected to have like the same and everyone's expected to 
sort of have the same goals or do the same thing. We all expect sort of monogamy and marriage, and this is the role that you play within that marriage. And when you have a family, here's what it means and here's what's expected of you. And I think that, um, you know, traditionally it has left out a lot of the gray area, a lot of the nuance that actual intimacy and love requires, right? Whereas we're going from this very Capricornian phase of, you know, love being ownership and property, we're moving into a more Aquarian phase where love is actually a vibration and love is uh, so much bigger than just the in real life day to day. I mean, yes, there's a way that we behave when we're in love, but it's less to do with following society's rules and more to do with actually connecting with yourself and connecting with your partners and really partner partners and really making sure that love, not fear, not ownership, not attachment is the energy that's leading us forward. I think that's like super duper important. There's also some really interesting asteroid stuff. Actually, on Monday, it'll be exact, but we have Chiron moving into a conjunction with Athena. To be really brief about what these asteroids represent, Chiron is the eternal wounded healer. So in everybody's chart, like in your own natal chart, you have a Chiron. In the collective, Chiron's always moving through. And it's identifying an area where, like in your own chart, it's going to be an area where you just have this aching pain that seems like it was there before you were born. It's almost like a, a, the kind of pain that you really think that you are never going to uh, heal from. But, you know, in the mythology of Chiron, and there's a lot of stories, but Chiron ultimately became a constellation. He was a centaur, and he Mars shot him in the leg, and Prometheus traded places with him. He was getting his stomach eaten out by the crow for years. I mean, this guy was in eternal pain, okay? And he was, otherwise, he was like the greatest teacher and the greatest healer and the greatest drug dealer, you know, in Athens or whatever, in, you know, in ancient times. Um, but it's like... He was the healer for everybody, but couldn't be healed and, and was just always writhing in pain. But through his facing of the pain and accepting it and integrating it and ultimately healing it, he became immortal. So everywhere in your chart where you or anywhere in your chart where you personally have Chiron, even if it's an area that you're like, I don't even want to go there. The less you want to go there, the more you're going to be forced to go there because you're going to be avoiding it. And so you really want to lean into your Chiron and do that work, even if it's painful or imperfect, because ultimately it will lead you into the thing that becomes a part of your legacy that lasts beyond your physical earth time, this go round, right? Now, when Chiron in the sky is in Aries, we're all being asked to take a look at our own sense of power and our own sense of, it's like, do we have enough confidence to follow that spark from within or where are we wounded where like either we can't even identify the sparks within that really light us up and, and make us want to um, act passionately to start something new or to lead or to you know in Aries or to even identify as Aries is the I am energy so Chiron and Aries is asking us all to go are you that or is that what society taught you to be or is that actually an overcompensation for something you're insecure about or um, or if it's you know if you're identifying a certain way because there's a part of you that does have certain desires or goals or dreams or ideas about who you might be in a different life with a different set of circumstances. And I think as Chiron moves towards Athena in Aries, Athena, who Athens is named for, uh, how do I tell the quick Athena story? Basically, she um, is Zeus, Jupiter's daughter, one of many, the guy got around. But while um, she was in utero, while she was uh, not yet born, he got a message from one of the gods that was like, hey, for the record, uh, this baby is about to be the most powerful and she's going to rock your world and take over your empire and become way more powerful than you. Zeus, egomaniac, he didn't have a lot of, there weren't a lot of therapists at that time other than Chiron and he seemed like maybe he could have used a therapist, you know. So anyway, uh, Zeus ate the mother of Athena and tried to suppress, suppress, suppress this energy, but he had a pounding headache that wouldn't go away, wouldn't go away. And eventually he had to go to the doctor. The doctor chopped his head open and out from his head emerged a fully formed bad bitch daughter who was supremely wise, but because she had been, uh, you know, talk about aborting. Okay. She was 
she was uh, killed before she was even born, and her mother went along with her, but yet her spirit was um, undeniable. And she grew from within, from the shadows of the most powerful person on the planet at that time, hypothetically. So Athena represents its, its high feminine wisdom that is not reactive, that's not coming from a rushed place, that's not coming from a... Um, a chaotic place. It's, you know, Athena was an incredible competitor and loved games and loved to kind of show up in the boys' room and, and sort of be like, well, if we did it my way, and then it's like, booyah, right? Like, these icebox from Little Giants, right? Like, so she's just like, look, you guys, I'm here for the team. I'm a little bit wiser, but I'm going to be patient enough for, to lead all you fuckheads into Rick Moranis' football win, okay? The, that analogy is not great, but... So Athena is this patient, high-level, detached from sort of the nitty-gritty of the drama uh, energy that allows us to focus and that allows us to give, give us a new way of looking at and thinking about, and this is right here, a new way of looking at and thinking about how we want to address that I am energy in ourselves. And it's about integrating the wound rather than overcompensating for it or ignoring it or trying to push through it, right? What Athena, I think, in Aries is trying to ask us to do is go, okay, look, we know that you've been traumatized, you've been hurt, you're hurting, but if you get out of the feelings energy of it, um, why was it a, why was it a good thing? Where's their gold in that? What did you learn? What sets you apart because of what you've been through? And now how do you bring that to the collective and to the people around you and to yourself and really like own the power in your story versus hiding in it, right? So I think that's um, just a really essential, um, it's a really essential asteroid goddess energy that we want to be looking out for. I really like that for this moon. Um, is there anything else that's really worth discussing? Well, just that asteroid union is conjunct Mars with Venus. So all of this all of this is for the purpose of bringing us into what is Virgo union. You know, Virgo's the virgin, but it doesn't actually mean we not fact in. When we talk about virgin uh, in the astrological sense, what we're talking about is wholeness of self. It's, it's actually um, the purity of being one with yourself. And it means when you're one with yourself, you're not driven by the lower physical nature, right? So this is about high love on every level, the highest love. And so there are parts of our ego that um, Kali wants to, to kill for the sake of true love and for the sake of a higher, more expansive experience of love um, that isn't even necessarily about like black friends and gal, gal friends. Have that trickle effect because the way that we do the work within ourselves reflects in the partners that we attract and the kind of relationships we attract. So if this full moon ultimately does first feel really confusing or emotional or watery, sit there with it, you know, um, and actually work with it from an intellectual place. You know, yes, that hurt and that hurts, but is there a value there? What, are you, what did you get out of it? Why was it worth it? How can you now take what you've learned and and change the conversation moving forward for yourself and for everyone that you interact with. Because, you know, I think it's really hard at this time to be like, what can I, Virgo, Pisces is the access of service, right? Uh, Pisces being this devotional, spiritual service, Virgo being the in real life, physical embodiment service. So there's sort of this question of like, well, how do we know what to do on earth if our spiritual connection is fuzzy or bogged down with spiritual bypassing or avoidance or just like emotionality that seems to have no end and no analysis, right? So this is not to say don't feel your feelings, feel your feelings, but don't believe that that feeling is where you are stuck or that that story is where you're going to just die. It's actually like, oh, this is like a chapter that, that you're now able to look back on and go, oh, you know what? This is the hero's journey I've been on, and now I'm ready for a big next, you know, this is like one Harry Potter book ends and another one begins, right? So this is like, we're still in the 
we're still in the franchise series of our lives, but but there's been a significant chapter that's almost finished, and we want to get ready for that new chapter where we're starting that new 12-month cycle. Um, on the 20th is the equinox, and then we have this very spiritual conjunction of um, Neptune and Jupiter on the 12th of April, which is going to be like an opening from a spiritual dimension, like like visions and inspiration. And if we do this work now with this full moon to actually like sort of balance our brains, come into purity, virginity, doesn't mean you don't have to fuck. It does mean you want to fuck in a holistic way and you want to do it um, with spiritual sensibility and awareness and not to get something out of someone or to prove something or to validate anything. It's really about making sure that we are, you know, right within how we're going to win. If we're not right within, we want to make sure we're right within and that our thinking and our channels are clear and being cleared so that we actually can enjoy the power wash and really have a sparkling clean, you know, machine body um, and, and receive the messages because we're not all gunked up, um, you know, from this past year, we want to really release, release, release so that we can enjoy the wash of, you know, spiritual lessons and messages and, and visions that we are going to actually just to that we're going to be that we're going to be privy to um, in the middle of April. And then it's going to really start to move forward because Jupiter is in Pisces for only a very short time. It, unfortunately, you know, because it's kind of fun. But Jupiter's going to move into Aries, um, like I believe it's in the end of May. And at that point, it's it's like, okay, now it's go time. All the things that you're healing within yourself now, come like the beginning of the summer and sort of May and, and, and through the summer, there's going to be this like explosion of, oh yeah, and now that I know who I am from a calm and balanced place, I am so ready to bring my gifts to the world. And so that's really what we want to be focused on for the next two weeks. We want to really do the the cleansing of the mental space and the cleansing of the ideas of perfection that society has put on us that can actually fuck our little Virgo minds up where we go, but but it's supposed to look this way. And it's like Virgo's dying to be perfect, but you better make sure that the, the perfect uh, vision that you are embodying is actually fucking perfect for you, right? So um, cleanse, clear out, KBRB, time to journal.